Ladies and gentlemen around the world, today with another episode of Round the Fire, we have Shada on, and she's going to talk about her incredible experience with bipolar disorder and improving her condition. And she doesn't um, use the word borderline yeah. personality disorder. Yeah, borderline personality disorder, BPD for short, yeah. and how she has improved it with carnivore. So, uh, Shada, uh, please uh, give us a background about yourself and your experience be, with BPD and how you benefited from carnivore. Sure. I'm currently 28 years old and I was diagnosed with borderline uh, in 2015. I'm not sure exactly how old I was, but um, my life has been a roller coaster, ups and downs, never any in betweens, um, never any stability. So um, dealing with that my whole life, I have missed out on opportunities. I have really um, made some difficult, disastrous and destructive decisions in my life. Um, I have left the trail of destruction behind me, things that I've done, people that I've hurt, you know, just living with borderline is like living in a really dark and um, scary place where you have no idea what the day or what the next hour is going to be like what the next minute is going to be like it's just like living by surprise in a way every single day every single minute every single hour anything used to be able to trigger me anything could just send me off of the edge i would just have mental breakdowns randomly um and it could be from absolutely anything anything that triggers me a film my husband um my main trigger is my husband just Living with borderline is like, um, you know, they say that it's like having uh, first degree burns, but with emotions, basically. So it's like an emotional burn every single time you experience something that should only be a little bit sad or a little bit um, not hurt that much. It's like going through a mourning period instead of just experiencing something for how it is, you experience. I used to experience it as an extreme. So my happies were never just happy. They were really, really, really manic. And my sads were never just sad. They were really, really, really low. So dealing with borderline is just like being on an emotional roller coaster every single day and just not knowing what direction that the roller coaster was going to go in. So it's just, yeah, it's very difficult to deal with. And it's something that I'm glad to be rid of. Of course, I'm still monitoring it, but it, it's been eight nine weeks now actually so unless it's turned into bipolar then I think I'm good because I've had a stable day every day for the last eight and a half weeks and how long did it take for the benefits to kick in okay so for the borderline personality disorder itself um it took about the first three weeks for the symptoms to start disappearing first two to three weeks but the depression and the anxiety that came with the borderline, um, the depression lifted after around day three. I started to feel really euphoric. I was only eating meat. Um, so beef, ground beef, eggs, um, bacon. And I had some steak first three days and I felt very euphoric. And I thought maybe it's just a manic phase that I'm going through. Maybe it's just um, one of these diso dissociated BPD symptoms. But no, after day, after day three, I woke up on day four and the depression was still gone. I wasn't manically high and I wasn't um, really, really low. It just felt, I just felt good for the first time in a long, long time after three days. So the depression went in three days and then the anxiety went in the first week. I realized that I wasn't scared to do things. I, I can make phone calls. I can answer messages. I can go outside without feeling like I'm in danger. Uh, there was no catastrophic thinking. Uh, so that was the first week, the anxiety. And then the borderline symptoms went away in the first two weeks. And they went away slowly. So first I realized that there wasn't really much um, negative thinking or uh, splitting so I wasn't splitting on my husband I wasn't hating him and then loving him and then hating him and loving him and then I realized that my emotions were quite stable and I wasn't usually when I used to feel emotions I'd feel something in my chest like that like heart what heartbreak what I imagine heartbreak to feel like and I didn't feel any of that when I think about something and when I had an emotion that 
um, the energy wasn't there. I didn't, it wasn't like overly emotional or anything. So the emotions uh, weren't so high and low after I, so the splitting, the emotions. And then after like week four, I just realized that my, my headspace was really clear, was really normal. I didn't really have, but all of the symptoms that come with borderline, I didn't have any of them anymore after week four. And it's just like, I'm a completely different person. And I don't even know who that person was. And I'm very, very, very adamant not to ever get back to that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got to know about um, BPD the hard way, actually, uh, not as hard as you. You lived with it, but I got to know, get to in into relationships with uh, people who are suffering from BPD and it is in, indeed as you have described it is a roller coaster and uh, could you remind me how long you've been uh, doing carnivore uh, you said it in the beginning ninth week now I started in the mm -hmm. uh, I started in the beginning of March mm -hmm. around the beginning so it's around my ninth week now I've yeah. lost count like specify specify the day that I started and it's been really really easy for me to keep up with it so it's not like i'm dragging it out and checking the days that i've been on it so i'm about the ninth week now i believe yeah there are so many things that i would like to bring up regarding bpd but one of the things that struck me when i watched your uh, first uh, watched your first interview i i mean that's the first time i got to know you it was your interview with dr baker um i was amazed by how um dedicated and how consistent you've been with carnivore and i also remember that you mentioned that you had a very good power of will in the you know, the people with bipolar uh, personality disorder that i have seen um power of will was not their forte and they would stick to something for a day or two and then just leave it um, so was it just a, a personal difference or the way you felt on carnivore helped you stay on track? It's a bit of both, actually, because I've always been a very militant kind of person. Um, mm -hmm. And even though I was suffering with the borderline, for instance, when I had my son and I was uh, around 230 pounds, when I decided, OK, I'm going to lose weight now, I stuck to it because I was actually suffering from an eating disorder on top of everything else. So I, I saw this, um, I saw somebody on Facebook, uh, Instagram mention that you can't compete with somebody that is either a really, really good athlete or a professional athlete, and you can't compete with somebody that has, that had or has an eating disorder, because we know how to uh, resist. We know how to not eat food when we shouldn't, well, when we feel like we shouldn't. So with me, it was um, a mix of both uh, the eating disorder and also how good I felt. Because after day three and a depression went and I realized, oh, it's food. And after a week, the anxiety went, I was like, okay, you can either go back to the way you were eating, one, get fat again, and you can get your depression and your anxiety back and all of the things that you are happy to be rid of. So it's a mix of both. And it's very, very easy for me to stick to because I didn't enjoy any of that. I didn't take my mental disabilities as my identity. I didn't want it. I didn't want mm -hmm. to accept, use it as an excuse to be the way that I was. I was constantly trying to work on myself. And there was a comment on um, Dr. Sean's, uh, on our podcast in the comment section. And someone said, well, I'm sorry, but it's not only diet that's doing it for this lady. It's also, you know, a lot of self-work and they are right. It's true. Not everybody will be able to start something and stick with it. Um, but in the past, I've done things. I started it and I stuck with it and I've made myself suffer even with no benefits, just for the benefit of weight loss. So now that I'm actually receiving benefits from it, it's, it's really, really easy. And um, I mentioned in one of my YouTube videos yesterday or the day before, it's no longer discipline that's driving me, it's fear, because I don't want to go back to the way I was. And fear mm -hmm. in society is a lot, uh, it's a much more powerful um, driver for the population than, than any kind of motivation or love. Fear is what drives most people. So I am being driven off of fear at this point, fear of the way that I used to be. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can look at it, or maybe you get to, to a point where it is not the fear it's just enjoying the way that you are feeling that keeps you in uh, on track and in line yeah 
And uh, something about bipolar um, a personality disorder is that and borderline it's, personality. I, I, I missed the personality again. No, the borderline. Oh. You can say bipolar is borderline. Personality. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that was where I was making the mistake. I was saying uh, bipolar. Yeah. I get it. It is like bipolar. It's like bipolar express. Is like yeah, but one. that is only one of the manifestations of it. Yeah. yeah I remember uh, in a relationship with someone who was suffering from bipolar. Uh, borderline personality disorder this time I got it right uh she once told me that the idol that I had made out of you uh just got shattered and I was like what the idol oh. <laughs> oh, why would you put someone on pedestal why would you um give someone the status of a kind of idol a kind of god and then uh, so that you get to the point that you have to shatter them um and these changes can happen in in a matter of seconds hours and yeah, yeah that's shocking and and the shocking thing the really shocking thing is that um i've been reading about uh borderline personality disorder the shocking thing about it is that it is so uh, prevalent it is so commonplace uh, for example they say well, and children who have experienced, uh, who have seen their uh, parents getting divorced at an early age, people who have gone through uh, mourning or th this experience, that experience, that uh, triggers um, borderline personality disorder. But we see that it's so commonplace that almost everyone with any kind of background can have it. And yeah. it really makes sense that something that every one of us is experiencing and that is the way we eat is causing it and uh, could you also give us uh, an overview of your food journey or non-food journey uh, into carnivore yeah it's a really long story but i'll make it short as possible i um i've started becoming aware of health when i was 17 years old so about 11 years ago and um at first, before I got into the eating disorder habit and lifestyle, I was really into the whole um, veganism and uh, eating her like using herbs for healing and stuff like that. Because even back then, my mental health issues weren't. My, I feel like my mental health issues were um, active from around 13, 12, 13 years old. I've been making really destructive decisions for a long time. So I first got into spirituality at around 16, 17. And I got involved with a community called uh, the Nuwapians, and they were very much so into healing uh, oneself through herbs and um, veganism and things like that, like really electric foods, like Dr. Sebi kind of movement. And then uh, when I was 17, I was introduced to the BLCD, the very low calorie diets um, by my friend. So these are packaged diets where you have three or four a day, every day. 750 calories 800 calories I was on those for a bit and that's where the eating disorder started and then after some time I stopped doing those and I just started to get really really obsessed with the gym and with um, eating the healthy balanced diet the vegetables the protein and the carbs of course and um, I stayed with that for a long time um, I I was trying everything especially for the depression because the the borderline kind of I felt like it, it helped me sometimes especially with my creativity my music I thought okay even though the lows are really bad it's kind of beneficial so I can live with this so um I was exercising for depression um I was trying to exercise for depression and I was eating still very low calorie but in a balanced way so the I was eating around maybe a thousand maybe a thousand uh, 200 calories and then um again I became vegan in about 2000 or 15 yeah actually when I was diagnosed with the borderline I became vegan um that's funny uh yeah so I was vegan and I was vegan for about a year after I had an, an LSD trip and the LSD trip I saw a cow and the cow was crying and it said stop eating me I was like okay I'm never gonna eat meat again it was really wild uh, so I was vegan for about a year and I got really really bad during that time it's like I went from being it's not normal but not as bad as I was to being really really bad and now I see the connection to plants 
um, and the mental state and what chemicals do I understand why I kind of went downhill. So after being vegan for uh, around a year, I went back to eating meat. I went back into the obsession with exercise and just eating a balanced diet. And I, I, was, I was very consistent with it because I was adamant that it was food. But I, I was just eating the wrong food. So then um, I came across fasting at a point um, not too long ago, actually, when I was um, when I just had my son in 2020, I came across intermittent fasting, OMAD one meal a day. And then that was really starting to I was starting to see some benefits from OMAD. I was eat, I wasn't eating for 23 hours. And then for one hour and one hour window, I would eat. And I felt great the rest of the time after about four hours after eating I felt great and then when I ate again the next day around noon was my eating time I just crashed and I felt like crap so after OMAD I after the intermittent fasting I um, discovered breatharianism I was listening to Ellie Tom Elamine on YouTube and so I, I said this is it this is going to be the one because you don't have to eat you can live off the sun when I don't eat I feel great no one can convince me anything else. My, I told my husband, I was like, I'm going to be a breatharian. I'm never going to eat again. But I was going to take the steps to be a breatharian. So I was going to, um, I was doing the OMAD. I switched from OMAD to alternate day fasting. So I had a meal on one day. I didn't have a meal the next day. Meal another day, didn't have a meal another day. And then I was going to switch from that to eating every two days. And then to every three days and to every week. And then to every, once every two weeks. I was feeding myself outside with because I live in Mexico, so I would just go outside and I was convinced that the sun was going to feed me. And then um, I just ended up coming across Dr. Ken Berry's video one day right next to um, Ellie Tom, well, in the recommended section when I was looking for more breatharian stuff. But I clicked on Dr. Ken's video and he was talking about this all meat based diet. And at first, I think I clicked off of it because I was like, this is absolutely fucking crazy. I'm, I'm a breatharian. Um, eating meat is going to bring me all the way down like I was I was into vibration and frequency I was before starting carnivore I was actually ridiculously um convinced that everything was spiritual so if I eat the animals then I'm going to be low vibrational I'm going to be full of fear I'm going to be full of hatred and you know all of that anxiety and stuff so I clicked off of it but and then like a day later I got curious because I'm a very curious person so I went back and I I basically binge watched all Ken Berry's videos and then I was like, okay, this makes sense. This makes scientific sense. It makes biological sense. Um, but I still didn't try it. I just, it, it's like I couldn't hear it up until recently. It's like I was listening. No, it's like I was hearing it, but I wasn't really listening to it. So then um, I was getting worse and worse and worse because after being a breatharian for a couple of days and going back to eating the normal food, it's like, like you do with carnivore, you develop these sensitivities. It's like I was developing sensitivities to these foods that I was really trying to wean myself off of. So when I went back to eat them, I got worse. So then eventually, um, that was like the end of last year. And the beginning of this year, I said to myself, January 1st, I'm going to be a carnivore. I'm going to start carnivore. And because I'm very extreme with everything, I thought I'm just going to just go straight from uh what I was doing to eat in carnival but I didn't I said okay look be uh realistic this time take it slow so I just cut things out of my diet first I cut out the donuts and the sweets and the really unhealthy junk foods and the, the chips and the crisps and then I cut out around February the potatoes I cut out the potatoes was my favorite like root vegetable um and I would just eat like potatoes with chicken. That was my healthy balanced diet. I don't, never liked vegetables. I always hated vegetables. It made me sick. So I cut out the vegetable. I'm um, sorry, the potatoes in around February. And then in March, I cut the beginning of March, around the 1st of March, I cut out the bread because I was having meat filled sandwiches, but I was having bread. So it was bread and then nine grain bread and then the meat in the middle. I said, okay, one day, no bread. And then I think... I, I think that was around the 3rd of March or something like that. So I just, it hurt me a lot. I took the bread off. I was like, okay, just eat the meat. Just meat. I tricked myself. I was like, just today, just today, no bread. Let's see how it goes. So then I just ate the meat. And the next day I did the same thing. I said, okay, no more bread today. You can go back to it whenever you want. Still in the cupboard. Just, just eat the meat. And the second day I ate the meat. And then the third day I woke up feeling, well, I was watching Netflix and then I realized my mind was really clear and I wasn't sad. I wasn't depressed. 
I was like, oh, two days of eating meat with no bread and I feel great. And what was in the bread was some um, bacon from Costco, some chicken um, and some, you know, the packaged ham and stuff, like processed ham and stuff. So yeah, um, after day three, I realized the depression went, I was like, oh, okay. I tricked myself into carnivore. And I just, from then it's been the same. I went out, I went shopping. I went to Cali Max and on my way to Cali Max, I planned to make this big shop because I planned to still eat all the foods I wanted to eat. But then when I got there, I said, no, don't get anything that is not carnivore today. Just today. I had to keep telling myself it's just for today. So then I did a shop. I went, I got some steaks, I got some eggs and I got some stuff for my son. Um, and then I walked out the shop with no non-carnivorous foods. I went home and that's where the journey began, beginning of March. And I just tricked myself into being carnivore and it's been history since then. That's actually what I wanted to get into, how you started it. So you didn't go cold turkey. You start to gradually remove things. And the other um, question that arises here. So you started in February, kind of uh, removing February. Oh, no, in January, I started um, taking things out in January. Mm -hmm. January. It was like a New Year's resolution. All right. So and uh, also... Mm, how about uh, herbal drinks and uh, also coffee? Do you consume any of them? What was the first one you mentioned? Um, for example, tea. Do you drink any kind of tea or herbs? Water. I've always just been a water person. Luckily, I never liked sodas. I never was into any kind of anything but water. Um, the most I used to drink was coffee, but then I realized it was really addicting because I didn't want to drink it every day. When I didn't drink it, I got a really bad migraine. So I just cut it out a long time ago. Um, just water. Yeah, actually, uh, coffee is something that makes me very jittery. And I uh, I haven't drank it for several months straight. Yeah. Then my relationship with coffee started to uh, get better. Uh, okay, I need to change the view because I see that it doesn't change to my own view. Okay. Yeah, so actually my teeth are thanking me and also my heart and my brain and I, I have much better sleep man uh, it's a really uh, a real a roller coaster and uh, something about your LSD trip and uh, also I remember from another one of your other interviews that you talked about ayahuasca and going on a um, actually a trip a kind of journey to uh, try it with a shaman and all uh, I want to know about how they affected you. Did, did they have any positive effect? Did they change your perception in any way? Or did they open your mind into trying something? Okay, so my psychedelic trip started with LSD. A friend of mine sent me a fake version of LSD through the post one day and I tried it and it had the same effects as normal LSD. And that was the moment where I went vegan after that LSD trip because you know, I don't know why the cow was on my light bulb, um, but it said, please don't eat me. I was like, okay, I'm not gonna eat you. Worst decision I ever made. But the LSD, I think personally, LSD is something that shows you more about yourself than anything else. It's like people trip about different things on LSD. They, we all kind of see the same things, but I think it shows you the true side of yourself. So LSD was a, it was a, okay. It opened my mind. It made my music a lot better. But in terms of my mental health, it didn't do anything. In fact, it probably made things worse because it made me feel more isolated as a person in society. So the LSD trips were fun. They made me make really great music, but, um, and they opened my mind a lot. They made me see that, okay, what is in front of us isn't just what's in front of us. Um, very, very beautiful trips, um, very mind opening, sure. And then after LSD, I tried, um, DMT uh, so I went through DMT experiences and you know DMT they say DMT is like what we have and what plants have in our bodies so like when you die or something that's what gets released so the DMT trips were a lot more eye-opening because I was seeing actually into other dimensions and you know it, with my eyes closed it, it basically felt like home so it's like the DMT trips it's like I got to visit home um and then the ayahuasca I didn't actually get to try the ayahuasca that was when I was here and well I'm still here in Mexico me and my husband came across somebody who had some ayahuasca in their home and um 
asked us if we wanted to do it, but unfortunately we didn't have enough money because it cost around two, two to three thousand dollars that we just don't have. We just opened the business and things are still up and like getting up and running. So we couldn't afford it. And the only reason I decided to do the ayahuasca is because my marriage was about to end. My marriage was about to like it, we was on the edge because of me, um, because of the issues that we had and all of my splitting and hating him. And so I thought that ayahuasca would be able to fix things. So before starting, well, it was around the same time as starting Carnivore, actually, I said, OK, let's try ayahuasca as a last resort. But the person said um, that it cost that much. So we said we're not going to do it. But um, I, I, I now personally feel like my it carnivore has put my faith into question about spirituality and everything because I used to be so convinced that it was something spiritual I used to be convinced that there was just something wrong with me and I needed to find peace and at this point I'm looking at all of these gurus like sad guru um I don't even I can't even bring their names off the head now but I'm like all these people are trying to sell people the happiness that I've got now the happiness that I found from eating the animals that even these gurus are telling people to not eat so my whole faith is in question now not that I'm an atheist I know there's something bigger something bigger than us but now all of the gurus I've ever listened to all of the books I've ever read they've just it's like become relevant to me because it was the meat that fixed some kind of serotonin and dopamine neurons in my brain and it wasn't the meditation it wasn't the sub the subconscious reprogramming it wasn't any of that it was the food I was eating and if somebody would have told me this 10 years ago, instead of blah, blah, blahing about be here and be now, then I might have been able to, to be a lot more productive in my life and be a lot further than I am now. But everything for a reason. So I guess I am where I'm meant to be. But my whole faith question. So the psychedelics, yeah, they helped me. They helped me open my mind and see things from in different realms and different dimensions and just know that this isn't all that we are. But uh, mentally, it didn't help me mentally. It probably made me worse because when you know more and you don't know what to actually do with it and you know you've got all this intelligence and you don't really know how to uh, apply it it's really hard especially dealing with a mental a, an existing mental health issue like bipolar or borderline disorder you've got all of this knowledge and all of this what comes with the psychedelics but you can't even implement it because you're still you know all over the place mentally and this is very interesting to hear because it is decreasing my curiosity about uh, psychedelic drugs. And I remember one person who was uh, himself a carnivore or probably keto, and he said that ketosis, having a child and psychedelic trip were some of the biggest experiences in my life. And, and now I am a bit discouraged to try that. Maybe I am already in a better state. Uh, I have experienced something that that is worth um, uh, ex experiencing and without any possible side effects. There are so many. I mean, maybe there are not much side effects or there is no, not any side effects for some people doing LSD or any other kind of psychedelic drugs. But if I am already there or I am experiencing something that is not even possible, and you can't even attain with them so I mean, it's uh, actually decreasing my curiosity about them you haven't tried any psychedelics no i, I am so uh, so curious about them i am very curious about them and i really want to try them and the interesting thing is that i had the perception that maybe people who try it uh, converge on some beliefs and they tend to believe the same things, but it seems not to be the case. Uh, and it also challenges this idea that there is a kind of absolute truth. So yeah. there is probably no absolute truth and every, everything is um, has subjective. to pass through our perception and is subjective, as you mentioned. Um, yeah, and actually I know someone who is a carnivore because of his psychedelic trip because he yeah i know that Dr. Stalino has interviewed him i don't know his own his uh, this person's name but uh maybe i can add it to the show notes or uh, I, I will text you the name afterwards he said that uh, i uh it made me appreciate the fact that an animal has died for me so i 
um, I became grateful for, for, for that animal. And when I was eating that, I was grateful that that animal has sacrificed its, its life for me. So it was um, uh, in contrast to so many of the other experiences that I have here. That was pretty yeah, so The opposite of the cow crying and telling me not to eat it. And on top of everything else, I feel like the psychedelics made me a lot more destructive because they kind of showed me the lack of importance of this particular you know experience so it was kind of like a none of this exists none of this is real so you can do whatever the fuck you want basically so it made me a lot more uncaring and you know destructive in a sense if it did anything for me it made me make more reckless decisions sometimes so everyone's experience in psychedelics is very different but with the dmt specifically i feel everyone's experience is pretty much i hear the same thing okay LSD is different, ayahuasca is different, but the DMT, everybody that I've spoken to and everybody I've done it with, we have the same experience. It's like we visit the same place, we see the same kind of beings. Um, and if not, you you will meet someone in your journey who has seen the exact same thing. So I think DMT is probably the only one, maybe ayahuasca, but I haven't tried it, so I couldn't say. But mushrooms, um, LSD, all of the other kind of salvia psychedelics. I think they have it's it depends on the person and it will show you you know a specific to you your um whatever it is going on in your psyche did you come to any particular uh, conclusions about life any kind of moments of it, epiphany while doing uh, dmt and the interesting thing for me is that everyone in that group had the same experience so yeah. i am searching for some <laughs> objective and absolute truth here so uh, what conclusions, what eye-opening moments did you have doing that? DMT, um, that this isn't home, that home is a place where, uh, it, you know, it's just, it's like trying to explain a dream that you've forgotten about. It's not that I forgot it, it's just very hard to put into words. It's, um, it's home, it feels like home. You feel complete in a sense. And my personal DMT experience was, I went there and because I was suffering in this world so much, some people, they get when they go there, they get full of anxiety because it's like, oh, oh, damn, I'm home. Like I've actually, you know, probably kind of died or something. It feels like a death experience. But for me, it was, it was, it felt good because I got relief from being a human. I got relief from my mind. I got relief from my body and it felt good. And I felt like this is where I want to be. This is where I want to stay. And I said to myself, if this is what happens when we die, then death has got to be an amazing thing. And it feels great because you just feel completely at one. And the, the visuals, it's like just, um, I don't know how to explain it, geometric patterns. And, you know, some people came, they see elves, but I saw like Egyptian cities and just like everything in one, everything that ever existed, everything that was to ever exist, all of the kind of colors that we've never known before, all of the kind of shapes we've never known the being shakti shiva um kali i saw shakti shiva and kali in my it's just very seeing everything everything that ever existed in one moment in one in a few seconds or a few minutes however long however long the trip lasts and i meet some people that say they see um other diet deities some people may, might see oshun and they're african deities but what, whatever experience people have had there is someone out there that has had either the same or a very similar experience. So uh, we have something like three minutes in this Zoom session. I don't know why it is uh, time restricted. So um, I have uh, written down my questions so that I don't forget. How about we end this session and start another one? Hopefully that one is uh, unlimited. Okay, so we are back to the second part of the recording. We didn't want it, it, uh, want it, it to be two parts. We didn't want it to be two parts, but it's happening. Seems uh, Zoom has restricted the time, even for two people. So uh, the questions that I have, yeah, uh, I think you mentioned this experience with LSD that um, nothing matters. You don't matter, as, as someone explained uh, explained it and described it. And I kind of liked that. It was like it took the burden off your shoulder. That's the imagination I had. But at the same time, when you look at it, maybe you stop trying. Maybe you say that, so what? Uh, so uh, from what I understand, from what I gather, for you, it had that destructive 
uh, side, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so in cold turkey and all of this, we have covered that. And also something that you mentioned about identity that sometimes uh, diseases or personality disorders or mental conditions become part of one's identity. For example, I am always that. I am an ADHD. I am um, yeah, obsessive um, OCD. And these things have, are becoming funny. And as a part of one uh, part of our personality, but they are truly not. For example, for someone who has experienced all the aforementioned uh, uh, mental disorders and mental conditions, they were literally not fun. Uh, it's not fun to have those. And it is uh, uh, really destructive to make uh, these things as a kind of, as a part of our uh, personality and define ourselves with. What are your thoughts on that? And how do you I mean, it, I, think, I'm, I think in a very controversial way. I don't like it. I don't respect it. Can't get with it. I feel I, a lot of the pages on Instagram of women that have BPD, I, I could tell that if I was to approach them, I would get met with a lot of resistance mm -hmm. simply because the page is full of everything to do with BPD but not only that it's glorified it's not just representing the BPD and I have BPD it's glorified just like you can glorify guns and you can glorify knife crime you can glorify crime like rappers doing their videos a lot of people that have mental health issues oh I'm bipolar and I this and I that or I'm borderline and I'm this and I'm that and it's like it's a shame that instead of trying to look for a way to heal and change um a lot of people especially females have taken it on and accepted it and i would like and i i also feel that a lot of people don't know who they are without the mental illness it's defined them for so long that they don't they're not very sure if there is somebody behind that and i myself thought sometimes maybe i'm a boring shit without my bpd maybe it's what makes me interesting it makes me different um being able to be creative and write loads of songs in like a an hour and going from that to not being able to do anything and just depressed and being depressed so I, I think that people taking it on as identity is dangerous because words are very powerful as well so the more that you claim it the more that it's going to affect you and the more that you're going to believe in it a belief is a very powerful thing so if you believe that you're stuck with it for the rest of your life then it's never going to go anywhere but if you believe that there's a way to heal if you really want to heal you'll find a way or you'll be open at least to um different ways of healing like I have always been on the lookout for something to heal me I've always I didn't want to accept it because it was it was nice when I was manic but I was still making really destructive decisions it was horrible when I was depressed and I couldn't do anything so um I'm really hoping to reach uh, a class of people that have um accepted the mental health issues as part of who they are and show them look you, there is a possibility that there's a really interesting person underneath all of this because for myself the borderline made me a oh, way way boring way more boring than I am now like I am starting to realize that I'm very very good at speaking I'm good at doing so many different things I'm good at communicating I'm good at um, helping people I'm very creative even like especially without the borderline because now I'm so consistent all I want to do is be creative all day and I don't have my depression and I don't have the anxiety. And I don't have any of the things that would, with the borderline, I'd be creative for like 30 minutes and then I, it would just go from out of nowhere. And I'd be like, what the hell? I don't be creative anymore. Like, okay, so what are we doing now? It's, it was really, it's like being controlled by, I don't know, a puppet master. And a lot of people that have borderline, they don't realize that behind the mental illness is someone really really interesting uh, behind the anxiety behind the depression and everything that comes with it there is someone that wants to just be free and I just I really hope to get that message out I don't like glorifying mental health issues um whenever I hear someone say oh I'm just bipolar um and using it as a joke it's like you have to be careful with that because you can manifest that into your life I don't I don't respect it I don't like it at all I understand why people do it but I don't think it should be a thing that should be glorified it, it's for people that are actually dealing with bad mental health issues it's um yeah it's, it's just not 
not great to do probably that. that comes uh, out of frustration that uh, you really see that there is no way out of it mm -hmm. and then you start to uh, you come to this understanding or you uh, come to believe that maybe this is who i am so i have to start find a way to live with it so it's yeah. that probably comes from frustration and they are uh, all these mental disorders are really frustrating and they really uh, define you if you don't find a way out and it's really difficult to find a way out and uh, mm -hmm. physical illness i see it with everything i see it with obesity yeah. I see obesity it with yeah yeah um, people, the fat acceptance movement, I see it with uh, people claiming their disorder, like my diabetes, my cancer, my this, my that. And because the doctor has told them that they're basically not curable, they've said, okay, this is mine now. I own it. I'm going to, you know, let it be known that this is my thing. And, it, and it, it's like people protect it in, in a way, but oh. it's, it's very hard. Like, especially, you know, with the fat acceptance community, it's like, okay, you want to love yourself, but, you know, not doing the things that are going to, you know, respecting your body and doing the things that would help your body isn't really showing yourself self-love. Self-love is doing, you know, being disciplined and showing yourself and proving to yourself that you're worth healing. Um, same with physical illnesses, uh, things that have been re um, re reversed by other people. But there's more um, examples of people healing physical illness, uh, reversing physical illness than there is mental illness. So to sit back and just accept that you have something in this day and age, I don't, I don't think it's you know the best thing to do for oneself because there are so many people healing now from alternative methods that it's not something that should be claimed illnesses in general, unless it truly is something maybe from birth that cannot be reversed, then there is always a chance. And I'm just, I'm hoping the carnivore community gets, because I'm seeing it. I'm, I'm like, what doesn't carnivore heal? I know there's something, but every single time I think of something and then it's like a week later, somebody comes through like, oh, my fibromyalgia is getting better. Oh, my asthma has gone and this and that. I'm like, okay, what the hell is going on? Is this like some kind of matrix that I fell into where things are just, un I don't know what's going on, but it's, it's nice to see. True that. And to your point, what you said about um, maybe there is someone else behind this uh, person with these personality disorders, uh, a person with these mental disorders. It reminds me of that story in Chicken Soup for the, for the mind, mm -hmm. for the soul, for the soul. So, yeah. yeah yeah i have forgotten the name of the author uh but it's uh, and i still remember this story that i maybe read in 2007 or so that he said that there there was a uh there was a statue that was uh covered with mud and at some point someone uh cracks the mud and there's a golden um, buddha that is behind that statue and they have put mud over it to um, protect it uh, against invasion. So the in invaders didn't, uh, invaded didn't touch it because it was just some muddy statue, but there was some golden statue behind it. And he said that there is some golden statue behind it. Maybe when you um, uh, put this, uh, these, these disorders away, there is a golden statue there. Mm -hmm. Maybe, definitely. Mm -hmm. As a, um, as someone who has experienced uh, borderline personality disorder, what is the best way to approach someone uh, with this disorder? What is the best, I mean, uh, roadmap to guide them, to uh, help them get the message? Because, for example, if I want to approach someone li uh, like the previous version of me, I have a difficult time um convincing them because of the thing that you said being lost in the matrix kind of uh how would you communicate when you are approaching someone who has uh, uh who is suffering from bpd how would you approach them and how would you make your message more effective and how would you make make them understand and feel it and find um find it doable okay so the my first rule to life and it kind of always has been is to lead by example so mm -hmm. with some 
like myself that has experienced it, it's much more easier for me because I obviously had something wrong with me. I've got all these tattoos, I've got tattoos on my face, on my neck. It's like I've had, I've lived this really crazy life. And if I was to sit down with someone personally that had BPD, I'd be able to say, oh, I used to have that. And then it would be like, what do you mean you used to have it? And that's where the, in, they, they get intrigued. It's like, yeah, I used to have that. I, and I'll show them all of the, you know, the evidence. Yeah, I was diagnosed with BPD. Blah, blah, blah. And then my next step would be to just um, either send them over to my YouTube or send them over to my Instagram, or I would just sit down and explain, look, all this time I thought that it was something I could never get rid of. And then I started eating a certain way. And then all of a sudden, it's like my my light just switched on. It's very easy for someone that's coming from that place to speak to somebody from that place. But somebody like yourself that hasn't suffered from borderline disorder, it's the only thing you could do is guide them towards somebody like Mm -hmm. me that, you know, has experienced it. Because the first thing someone is going to say to you that has a mental health issue is, well, you You are not me. You have an so you have no right to tell me about how I need to deal with my mental health issues so it's really just about guiding them in the right direction I think and um, if you have enough knowledge about it then just saying yeah I know somebody that you could just do what I they, I know somebody that used to have that and then they might be intrigued like what do you mean they used to have it, <laughs> do you have it? Do you have it no more they, they, and I think the rebuttal that you'll probably get is well they must have never had it and you're like no I definitely no, they That's had funny. it so just saying, just by saying something like, so it's like with someone with diabetes. Oh, I know someone that used to have diabetes. And then there is going to just like, oh, they used to have it. What did they do? That's a natural human response. What did they do? What did they do? How did they do it? And then they'll want to go and look into it. So I think that's the best response you can have to someone. Just say, yeah, I know somebody that used to have that. And I think the conversation will just go from there. Whether if they're interested, they'll let you know they're interested. If they're not, you will see it just go over their head and just kind of go through them. Some people were, they, they're not, they can't really hear things or listen to things until they're in the right vibrational space to do that. I, there's mm. something I, like, I came across Joe Rogan's channel three years, around six years ago or something, no, three years ago, this woman talking about carnivore. I remember exactly what I thought. That Michaela? Time. Um, not Michaela, it was somebody else, um, another woman. And mm. I just talking about the carnivore diet uh she had blonde hair um three years ago or so and I I, I said look at this um look at this cave woman that's exactly what I said I look at this <laughs> cave woman talking about carnival diet just eating meat is she crazy like that that is exactly what I thought and at that point three years ago I couldn't hear nothing you couldn't tell me anything about no animal diet based nothing so I get it. The cognitive dissonance that people have, you have to be at a certain level vibrationally before you're even able to hear what somebody else has to say. And I feel like that's just, I don't know, it's just a soul thing. It's just a human thing. You're never going to hear what's not for you until it's time for you to hear it. So saying to somebody, I know somebody that used to have that, you're going to see at what level and vibration they are in their life. And then you get the conversation going or you just have to leave them to go along in their journey but it cannot be forced you have to lead by example or show them somebody that is leading by example when the student is ready the master with the fear something exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's true and uh, actually i wasn't thinking about um introducing a carnivore to the bipolar people um sorry borderline people that i know because for me approaching them, it would be impossible because that would be the first response um, that you are not me. And you don't know what I am going through, that you don't have the same thoughts as me. And uh, yeah, maybe most of the time, the best way to get to someone is that someone who used to have it should get to them. Or as you said, yeah, guiding them. Uh, towards that way and it is uh, always difficult to get the message across even I used to be obese when I tell someone that I used to be obese and even when they um, talk about losing weight and I show my before picture I see that there's a a resistance that they don't want to accept the message what you are eating meat all, all the time and you are losing weight how about your heart maybe that's because you're young you haven't dropped it yet uh, there's all uh, these uh, these uh, resistances that you you would face even when uh, you are the person who already 
uh, has been there where they are now. Yeah. Yes, because the um, it's not just resistance, but it's excuses also. Because as True. much as people True. want to, and as much as people want to do better for themselves, mm. the actions that need to be taken behind bettering yourself is what puts most people off. Because everybody wants a quick fix. Everyone wants a mm. quick fix. We're in a society now where if it's not instant gratification, then it's just nothing. So if if it's not a, a fad diet, you know, even like one of the diets I used to do, like the um the slim and save or the lipo trim these packaged diets they will be more open to the packaged diets and to the low 750 calorie quick fixes than they will to something like carnival but that's because as a society we've been told that red meat and eggs and all of the stuff that's actually good for us is bad for us and i even when i, I started i tried to do carnival a couple of weeks before i officially started i did it for a day i, I just had lots of eggs mm. and bacon and I felt horrible. I felt greasy. It felt disgusting. I was like, what the fuck is this nonsense? And I, I kind of agreed to start Carnival with my mom, who she's not doing it at the moment, but she's showing interest. But both of us kind of felt the same. It was like, this feels horrible. It feels greasy. It just, it didn't make any sense. And for, for somebody like myself, I have to understand exactly what is happening with the body i have to know the, the biology the, the the nutritional value um, the nutritional value everything and then once i understand what it is that i'm putting in my body i can you know now feed myself with like okay this is nutritional it might feel greasy but it's actually helping me and then when the results appear finally you're like oh okay so it's not as horrible and greasy and nasty as i thought and i think a lot of people go through that in the beginning we've been told that it's bad for us so of course the cognitive this is dissonance of society is well i'm not going to eat that because i'd rather be fat than have a heart attack but you're you're fat and you're going to have a heart attack why not take the risk anyway so you know it's it's hard man how about for example one week just try it you, you wouldn't drop that in one week how about try yeah. it and you see that, that that's a kind of re religious experience uh that yeah. when you uh when your cognition changes when you see that you have stable energy that's a uh, that's something that you have probably never felt maybe when you were a baby but you don't have a memory of that so that doesn't count so uh, when that experience kicks in then you realize that maybe all those things are not correct and this uh to your point when you said that uh, when you say I know a person who used to have BPD and they are like used to. There are uh, some uh, personality disorder books that I have read. And most of the time, the preface starts with a case with uh, borderline personality disorder. And they are ex explaining, describing how difficult it is to deal with. And that is the worst um, personality disorder that you, uh, that you as a psycho psychologist would deal with. And you might be able to stabilize it as and the and people age, they become more stable because they see their uh, negative effects of their actions and they say, maybe uh, we should change this and that. But there is no cure. Yeah, no cure. No cure. <laughs> no it cure. is something that they unanimously believe. And yeah, the first reaction would be, uh, maybe that person never had it. Exactly. And I, I know I'm going to get a lot of that. I know I'm going to, people are going to question, you know, but there's too much destructive in my, there's too much destructive path left behind me. I, I have relationships I have to go back and fix. I have family that I need to, you know, that there is so much for me to rebuild. So many bridges that have been burned. So many people that have been destroyed because of the way that I was. And it's not something that, this is something that can be proved. And I, all I have to do is show someone, look, this is what I used to go through, even though the, I won't talk about it now, I will talk about it when I'm ready in the future, even that the line of work that I chose to go down, that was like a whole destructive path that I never truly needed to go down. And as I am now, I could never imagine doing anything like that. I, I because I have such a creative, um, I understand now when people used to say, well, you're a lot better than that, Shade. why are you doing that? Where it's like, now I get it, I see it because I'm not trapped in my own mind. I'm not being controlled by emotions. I don't have to hide away from the world like I used to. So now I see the potential that everybody used to speak about, but 
the life that I've lived over the past decade is living proof that you know it's it, it was on the extreme end of borderline personality disorder the very extreme end so for anybody that you know wants to say anything like oh maybe she never had it it's the, the proof is in the pudding the proof is in the pudding and it's just very hard um and it's I've done a lot of mourning over the past nine weeks well over the past seven eight weeks because I've mourned the person that I could have been because I've always been this creative being and I know that if I was given the tools from just I, I had a conversation with my husband the other day and I said to him what, what would be the one thing you would change if you could go back to like being 10 11 years old I forgot what he said but um I I said if I could change one thing I would just be a carnivore I wouldn't change anything else but I would just eat a lot of yeah, freaking meat the greatest potential of my own being that's the only thing I'd do is eat meat and not mm. avoid it like he said to because then I would have been able to live my potential for the past two decades not just for the past you know mm -hmm. so uh, yeah yeah and has your diet and the changes that your husband has witnessed um started to make any changes he's in in his diet too has he become interested or has there been any change in his diet too uh yeah he eats a lot more meat um he's a lot more conscious of what he eats now um I feel when you're on something like carnival it, it, it makes people around you start to uh really account for themselves too so he started to account for himself and I'm like you know you can do you I don't want to force you to do anything I'm just trying to live by example but he'll he'll try and explain to me why he's not eating carnival or why he's eating a taco or a burrito or something and I'm like you don't need to give me excuses just do you but he's eating a lot more meat and I can see eventually as the better I get the more turned on I get I feel it's naturally happening it's naturally happening he's eating a lot more meat anyway he's always been a meat lover but he's seeing my memory improve. He's seeing my mind transform. He's seeing my, my body is getting leaner and I don't even exercise. There are so many things happening that nobody that wants better for themselves can be around you and not be intrigued and not want to do it. So yeah, he's, he, his, his energy about it is changing. He is really interested in it. And I think the longer he sees me do it for, because he's always seen me just jump onto things and jump off of things. Even if it was a diet that lasted months, I still jump on and jump off. So I believe give this maybe a year. And he's like, this woman has been sticking to something for the first time since I've known her for a whole year. Maybe there's something to this. So like I said, I'm just a big believer in living by example, but yes, he's showing interest. And my toddler as well, he's going to be through this month. He, I'm trying to get him to a uh, majority carnivore. He is 90% carnivore with me. I give him fruits for snacks. And, um, but when he's out, when he's not with me, when he's with the babies and stuff, they do give him a lot of sugar and stuff. So I'm trying to nip that in the bud a little bit by making sure that I give them the food that I would like them to feed him. I think that's just being a bit lazy on my part. But yes, I'm hoping both my husband and my son follow more of a carnivorous way just for their own potential, just because of what I know that my son will be capable of and what my husband will be capable of if his his he's already a very brilliant person and a very intelligent person so I can only imagine what carnival would do for him and how much it would switch him on if he was to go carnival but I don't want to say all these things I just want to live it and then you know just be the case that can be studied so he can just make his own yeah and uh, let's go back to your experience with breatharians I mean, I have read about breatharianism and it struck me so strange that I could believe it. Uh, so I want to ask you as someone who has gone through the, uh, that past, it means that you shouldn't eat anything and the gurus in this area really don't eat anything. I mean, maybe they are caught red-handed some, sometimes, but uh, that is what the message that they are promoting, that we are getting our energy from the sun and water. Okay, so the person that I was following, Ellie Tom Elamine, he was a lot more realistic than the crazy breatharians that I have come across. I've, there's some breatharians that drink their own pee, that do a lot of really radical shit. But Ellie Tom Elamine, he was, he, his own version of it was eating um, little, little to nothing or nothing at all. 
So with him, he, he admits he has some fruit sometimes. He might have a meal every once in a while. So he wasn't the extreme side of breatharianism, not somebody that claims to have never touched food for the last 20 years. He's, um, his stance was little to nothing or nothing at all. So um, I, I do believe that there are a lot of charlatans around, uh, especially the breatharianism, but it made sense. It made, when I sat, I sat down and went through every, most of his interviews, and it just, because I needed it to make sense, it made so much sense to me. And when I experienced it for myself, the same euphoria, the euphoria that I felt with carnivore, I felt with the breatharianism. The longer I didn't eat, the happier I got, the better I felt. And my mind was, all of the benefits that I felt feel on carnivore, I felt while I was not eating. The only issue was, was the food that I went back to. Now, I, I feel like breatharianism and carnivore would work really well together, but unfortunately, they're on two opposite ends of the spectrum. Go, going from fasting to eating meat, I think is the most perfect thing anyone can do for themselves. So um, yeah, the breatharianism, it's, it's very, it's unrealistic in a sense, but there are people doing it. There are people that just won't touch food. And again, I think uh, belief is a very powerful thing. I think if somebody that truly believes meat is going to kill them and truly believes that they're going to have a heart attack, eventually something along those lines might happen just because their belief was so powerful and it had a stronghold over them. That same with the breatharianism. I believe that people that think that they can live without food, like someone like myself, I think I could have gone a long way with it. I could have probably ate once every two weeks and been absolutely fine because I know that my power of belief is so strong. But um, yeah, I believe there's a lot of charlatan breatharians out, out there, but Ellie Tom Elamine, he's very realistic. I do love the guy talking about um, not eating anything or eating, eating very little was a very more, it was a much more realistic approach for people. So if anyone is wanting to go down that path, I think going, following him would be the best. And I'm, you know, I'm happy I came across that before coming across carnival because now I can implement the two, the fasting and the carnival, staying in ketosis and giving my brain the good stuff that's that it needs and then also giving my body the break that it needs to repair itself and do all of the good stuff that it does when one is not eating the problem with that is that even if when it has benefits you can only not eat food for so long you eventually have to eat but with carnivore mm -hmm. you can eat and you can be healthy that's the good thing about it so uh, i want to be respectful of your, your time once again thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing your experience with us uh, most definitely, uh, if the time allows, uh, we're going to have you on again to uh, talk more about your experience when uh, a longer time has passed. Uh, could you let us know that people know how to, where to uh, follow your stuff? Sure. I'm on Instagram as Carnivore BPD. So that's Borderline Personality Eater Sort of Short BPD. Um, and YouTube is the same, Carnivore, BPD, very simple. It's the same everywhere. I'm on TikTok too, but I don't know how to use it yet. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, so yeah, Carnivore, BPD, Instagram, and YouTube at the moment. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, actually, yeah, TikTok is a, very difficult for me to engage with. And um, maybe that's good because one less social media to be addicted to. <laughs> so I don't even have it. Yeah. And I'm following uh, you on both of the platforms that you just mentioned. The moment that I um, finished listening to you, your interview with Dr. Baker, I started following you on them. And actually, it was uh, exactly after that that I messaged you to arrange this interview. Thank you so much. And thanks for uh, talking to us about your experience. Thanks for having me. It's been a great conversation. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Round the Fire. If you are watching this video on YouTube, please give it a like and hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave the five star review. It would cost you nothing but help me a great deal, especially if you do so on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you feel particularly generous, consider supporting me via Patreon, PayPal or Bitcoin.